Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening. As always, go to reallifepharmacology.com, snag your free 31-page PDF, a great study guide on the top 200 drugs, uh, where I relay uh, important information that's going to come up on board exams, uh, like has uh, like it has come up in uh, board exams throughout my career, uh, as well as clinical practice pearls and things that uh, actually come up in, in real life. So uh, definitely go check that out. It's a 31-page PDF, absolutely for free. Um, no cost to you, simply for uh, subscribing and, and following the podcast, and uh, we'll let you know when we've got new content available. So uh, go check that out, reallifepharmacology.com. All right, the drug of the day today is quetiapine. Uh, brand name of this medication is Seroquel. Uh, it is definitely a medication that I see used uh, in clinical practice a, a fair amount, uh, particularly uh, in my geriatric population, uh, where we've got psychosis associated with uh, dementia and those type of, of uh, cognitive disorders. Uh, it is classified as an antipsychotic, of course. So mechanistically, it's going to block uh, dopamine receptors, specifically uh, D2. Uh, it also has uh, some serotonin type 2 receptor a blockade or an antagonism as well there. Um, but again, being in that, that class of antipsychotics, we're typically going to think of uh, dopamine blockade as kind of the, the primary mechanism. Uh, in addition, it does have uh, other activity as well from a mechanism of action standpoint. Uh, so we've got some alpha blocking uh, activity potentially, uh, as well as antihistamine, um, kind of slash anticholinergic type activity as well. And uh, as we talk about adverse effects, uh, you're going to see why uh, some of those kind of sub-mechanisms may impact uh, patient care and the risk for adverse effects. Now, uses of this medication, uh, certainly schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, with associated mania, that type of thing, uh, mis miscellaneous kind of psychotic disorders, um, Parkinson's type disease uh, with uh, psychosis associated with that. Uh, Off-label, you may see OCD, uh, augmentation for uh, PTSD, depression. So there's there's definitely lots of different psych purposes I've, I've seen it used for. Um, again, in my practice, uh, most often I'm going to see this medication started for uh, those delusional, psychotic-type behaviors in, in patients with dementia. And, of course, from an adverse effect profile and a boxed warning profile, um, there is an increased risk of mortality, and that boxed warning uh, is associated with quetiapine uh, as well as all the other uh, antipsychotics. So, again, that boxed warning, increased risk of mortality uh, in elderly uh, dementia patients. So important to think about that, and if you're ever going to use an antipsychotic in a dementia patient, um, that warning weighs heavily, and, and that's why uh, we try to avoid antipsychotics in that patient population, if at all possible. From a class perspective with antipsychotics, so you've got your extrapyramidal symptoms, so those are those movement-type side effects, uh, metabolic syndrome, anticholinergic activity, QTC prolongation, sexual dysfunction, uh, hyperprolactinemia, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, sedation, falls, uh, and potentially a drop in, in blood pressure as well. But um, that's, that's an overwhelming list <laughs> to think about. And with uh, quetiapine, it's important to uh, recognize that antipsychotics kind of have varying degrees of how much they cause those adverse effects. And obviously, a lot of those adverse effects are dose-dependent as well. The higher you escalate the dose, the more and more likely you're going to run into uh, some of these adverse effects that I, I just rambled through there. So three important points um, that, that I want to pull out with quetiapine. So metabolic syndrome... Um, it's not that great as far as metabolic syndrome risk goes. Um, it's kind of middle of the pack uh, 
Uh, I would say it's not um, as bad as like a olanzapine or a clozapine, but it's not as good um, as a, a drug like aripiprazole that's in the uh, antipsychotic class there. Uh, extra pyramidal symptoms, uh, definitely better than than most uh, as far as that goes. So this is a drug, quetiapine, that you classically see in a patient with uh, Parkinson's disorder and they're having uh, psychosis type issues. Now we're going to do other things to address that psychosis besides just add an antipsychotic, we're going to look at dosing of, you know, cinnamon if they're on that and, and, and some other things there. Um, but quetiapine of many of the other antipsychotics carries a little bit lower risk of exacerbating some of those movement disorders. So remember in, in Parkinson's, we try to supplement with dopamine and remember antipsychotics try to block that dopamine. So it's kind of this, you know, beneficial opposition type effect, this kind of back and forth uh, interplay with with dopamine that can get sometimes very, very challenging to figure out uh, in a Parkinson's patient uh, who also has uh, psychosis associated with their Parkinson's disease. So metabolic syndrome, kind of middle of the road, that's that's an important uh, thing to, to remember, I think, in, in practice. Um, Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's psychosis, um, lower risk at exacerbating some of those uh, movement disorders compared to uh, other antipsychotics like risperidone, for example, would be a higher risk agent there. And sed sedation, um, olanzapine, or excuse me, quetiapine, um, it tends to be more on the sedating side of things. So where I've seen that utilized is patients that have a lot of difficulties with um, uh, psychosis issues at night. Maybe they're having hallucinations, delusions, um, and it's more so in the evening hours. Uh, you may see quetiapine utilized for that because it, it may tend to be a little bit more sedating um, than some of the other uh, antipsychotics, or it's on the, the higher end anyway. So those are kind of some uh, clinical quirks and, and pearls uh, in situations where you may see quetiapine used compared to uh, some of the uh, other antipsychotics. And again, kind of going back to, to metabolic syndrome, that's something we generally worry more about in a patient, you know, a 20 plus something year old schizophrenic. We're going to worry more about development of diabetes and hyperlipidemia than we are in a you know, 85 year old that we're using it for dementia related psychosis. So, um, again, these, these adverse effects and these things can kind of, um, have different points of emphasis based upon the, uh, age of the patient. Now thinking about that elderly patient sedation and fall risk, that's going to probably be a lot higher on our radar, um, that may impact the, the patient and cause them more immediate harm. Um, than something like metabolic syndrome. So again, just kind of thinking about your, your patients clinically and what's important to them uh, in that situation and what adverse effects we're trying to avoid or minimize um, versus other adverse effects that, you know, probably aren't as big a deal. All right, wrapping up here, I wanted to touch on kinetics a little bit. Um, remember that with kinetics, 3A4 is a pathway of breakdown for quetiapine. So as you're going to see in the, the drug interaction section, that, that is important to uh, think about a little bit anyway. And then, of course, uh, I wanted to mention absorption as well. So with larger food intakes, uh, absorption can increase in the, the neighborhood of you know, 15 to 25 percent, and that's uh, AUC or area under the curve. So essentially the exposure, uh, systemic exposure to the drug uh, can increase uh, 15 to 25 percent in that ballpark based upon um, a larger meal or a high fat meal um, that, that may go up a little bit um, further even. So uh, with that said, uh, the way I think about this clinically is it's usually not a big deal in my mind, um, 15 to, to 25%, um, where I do get a little bit 
more worried is if patients kind of change the way they take it. And so if I encounter a patient that's maybe experiencing um, quetiapine adverse effects or potentially quetiapine adverse effects, um, I'm and their dose has been overall pretty stable over the last year or two, for example, that's a situation where I'm going to maybe dig into that and say, hey, have you have you changed the way you take it? You know, do you now take it with food? And before you didn't take it with food, um, that that's kind of an example of, of where I would maybe get a little bit more worried about the absorption um, and the way a, a patient is taking that. So um, if it's a, a new start and, and we're titrating the dose, um, you know, I, I, it's not a huge deal, but I, I would probably just encourage consistency um, and, and just continuing to, to take it in the same way at the same time. Uh, every day, depending upon, you know, how we're dosing it and that type of thing, because it, it might be dosed two or three times a day, uh, depending upon the, the product you're using versus immediate release versus extended release. Um, but I think just that, that consistency is probably the most important uh, education point uh, to kind of emphasize with your patients there. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material like pharmacotherapy, ambulatory care, geriatrics exam, psychiatric exam, BCMTMS, or you're a student taking the NAPLEX soon, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. We've got links to all of our content uh, in your preparation for those board exams. In addition, if you're a nurse, nurse practitioner, dietitian, uh, med student, physician. Uh, we've got all sorts of case studies, clinical pearls um, on various topics. So my latest book, Perils of Polypharmacy, um, I go through lots of case scenarios of polypharmacy patients and basically help break them down, help educate about some of the, the challenges and struggles that we deal with um, when it comes to, to polypharmacy. So um, great little book, great read. Uh, I think you'll find a, a lot of the information in there uh, is really relevant and things that you actually see in clinical practice because I developed it based upon uh, things that, that I've actually seen throughout my years of experience uh, as a clinical pharmacist. So again, all those links, everything uh, I've got there, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. And obviously your support there uh, helps grow this podcast and, and help keeps it free uh, for all those to uh, benefit from. All right, so let's finish up on drug interactions. So um, first, when I think of drug interactions and antipsychotics, um, I usually think of additive effects. So sedation is an issue with quetiapine. If we add it on to other sedating medications, uh, alcohol, opioids, benzodiazepines, um, you name it, that sedation can really ramp up and, and potentially slam a patient. So important to remember that. QT prolongation, same thing, kind of an additive type of thing. If you've got patient on uh, antiarrhythmics, you know, classic example being amiodarone. Uh, if you've got them on uh, quinolone antibiotics, if you've got them on other antipsychotics, if you've got them on uh, on Dancitron is another example. Um, these can all have kind of cumulative additive effects uh, for QT prolongation. So uh, important to think about that, important to monitor that. And obviously uh, that risk increases as we add on more and more meds that can um, cause that risk. Uh, lower blood pressure. So I mentioned uh, quetiapine has some alpha blocking activity potentially. Um, so that you know might be one of the reasons mechanistically why it can cause some hypotension sometime. So definitely think about that additive effect. If you've got a borderline patient, that borderline low blood pressure patient that's at risk for falls, um, quetiapine could potentially uh, add on to that for sure. And also mechanistically, I mentioned uh, potential antihistamine, anticholinergic burden. Um, that can play a role in adding on to the anticholinergic burden of other medications. So, um, you know, your oxybutynins, your uh, anti older antihistamines like your diphenhydramines, these can all kind of have a cumulative effect together and potentially 
um, put your patient more at risk for uh, anticholinergic type effects. And then lastly, uh, it is metabolized at least in part by CYP3A4. So there is some potential there for drug interaction. So your classic enzyme inducers uh, like your St. John's wort, carbamazepine, those could lower concentrations of quetiapine while inhibitors uh, would have the, the potential to mildly increase concentrations of quetiapine. So I think that wraps up my highlights on quetiapine. I hope you found this podcast beneficial. Please leave a rating, review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. I'm greatly appreciative uh, to those of you who have already done that. Also share us with colleagues, friends, students that you're precepting, um, other healthcare professions that may need some more education on medications. Um, please email, links, share, um, uh, do whatever you can to, to kind of help grow that. This podcast, I'm, I'm greatly appreciative to those of you who have done that and have told me about it. Um, really, really thankful and, and humbled by the number of uh, people who have uh, found some help and, and guidance uh, with this podcast. So greatly appreciative of to all of you who have, who have helped share the podcast and certainly grow the audience. Uh, if you enjoy the, the content here, certainly you're going to benefit and enjoy a lot of the content at meded101.com slash store. So go support our sponsor, help keep this podcast free uh, for others to, to benefit from. And if you want to track me down, comments, suggestions, mededucation101 at gmail.com or LinkedIn is probably the best social media network to track me down at. So uh, with that said, I'm going to sign off for today. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you found this helpful and I hope you have a great rest of your day.